Hi class, in this recording we're going to talk about how we can get air to move in and out of the lungs, so the pressure and resistance and things that influence airflow. So as we look at airflow in general, respiratory airflow is going to be governed in the same way that the fluids of the circulatory system, the blood, are governed. So we're going to have pressure and resistance being two big factors here. The flu flow of a fluid is directly proportional to the difference between the two pressure points. So the higher the pressure gradient, so the difference between the high pressure and the low pressure, determines if a fluid will flow. And if we have a bigger difference, the fluid flows faster. And then in terms of resistance, the more resistance to movement, the less flow the fluid will have. So what does this mean? This means that the harder we push, the faster we move air, and the more difficult it is to push, the harder and slower it is we'll move air. So when we think of pressures, we first need our baseline, and our baseline is 760 millimeters of mercury or atmospheric pressure, also known as one ATM, and I'll admit I'm an ATM kind of guy. That's my favorite unit of at pressure for atmospheric pressure in particular, and this is how much the way this is the pressure of the air above us pushing down on us. The higher our elevation, the less air is above us and the lower the air pressure becomes. So as we look at Boyle's Law, and this may remind you of a chemistry class you may have taken as a prerequisite for this one. The idea behind Boyle's Law is that pressure is going to be proportional to volume inversely. So as volume goes up, pressure goes down and vice versa. So there's going to be this inverse proportional relationship with them. And then conversely, if pressure goes up, volume has to go down. So if the lung volume goes up, the lung, pre the lung pressure, also known as intra, intra meaning inside, inside of what the palma, palm means lung, so that the inside lung pressure, intrapulmonary pressure, goes down when volume goes up. This means that the pressure in our lungs will be less than atmospheric pressure, and that causes air, causes air to go from the outside atmosphere into the lungs. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if we decrease our lung volume, lung volume goes down, the pressure in the lungs goes up. So that intrapulmonary pressure will go up as pressure in our lungs rises above atmospheric pressure, we have air ultimately moving out of the lungs. So intra, meaning inside, and then plural, referring to the plural membranes. And that's kind of confusing for a lot of indiv individuals. We have intrapulmonary for inside of the lungs, and then we have intrapleural for inside of the pleural membrane, between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. We need to have a slightly negative pressure between the visceral and parietal pleuras. This is going to cause the recoil of the lung tissue and the thoracic cages to be pull constantly pulling it against each other in opposite directions. We have a very small amount of that parietal or pleural fluid in this cavity that allows for these layers to stay close together, to be, remain stuck together um, as we have the thoracic cage pulling against the lung and have them exerting force against each other. So as we look at these layers, and these pleural letter, layers, they cling to each other. Right here we have the visceral pleura or parietal pleura towards the outside and the visceral pleura towards the inside. They cling to each other because there's lots of cohesion of the water molecules, lots of hydrogen bonding of the water molecules that make them up. And when we swing our ribs upward, those up the upward motion of our ribs is going to pull the parietal pleura with them because the parietal pleura is part of the thoracic wall. And then as the parietal pleura is pulled upwards with the ribs, the visceral pleura will pu be pulled with it because water will have the parietal and visceral pleura be cl clinging together. And as the visceral pleura, that inner membrane, is pulled upward, it will then pull the lungs themselves upward, stretching out the, the alveoli, causing the entire lungs to expand with the thoracic cage and have an increase in volume. And that increase in volume causes pressure to go down, and air will flow from the hot, that we have higher pressure outside, air will flow in to the lungs when we lower the pressure inside of the lungs, 
relative to the outer atmospheric pressure. Now, another thing that we need to account for is thermal expansion. When we warm up air, the air will expand to become less dense, which is why we have a picture of a hot air balloon. We have lots of thermal expansion filling up this balloon, causing it to float up into the air. So as the air is warmed in our conducting zone, that air expands. And as we increase our, the temperature of our air, the air occupies a higher volume. And as we warm our air approximately 15 degrees Celsius, and this will ultimately cause, this warming will ultimately cause about a 7% increase in the volume of air just by warming it 15 degrees Celsius. As we look at this process of breathing in, the first stage or the first kind of breathing in or inspiration that we should talk about is quiet breathing. And during this quiet breathing, thoracic cage is only going to increase a few millimeters in volume in each direction. I like to think of this as lazy breathing. We only increase the volume of our lungs by approximately 500 milliliters. So we'll only have about 500 milliliters of air flow into our respiratory tract. During this relaxed breathing, there's particularly exhalation phase of relaxed breathing um, for expiration, we just naturally relax our ribs, the muscles of our diaphragm and external intercostals. And then we will passively recoil our lungs due to the elastic tissue within our lungs. This is going to compress the lungs, causing the volume of our thoracic cavity to go down. As the volume of our thoracic cavity goes down, air pressure within the thoracic cavity increases, forcing air out. During a forced breathing situation, we use accessory muscles that we've already talked about in the previous recording to force the lungs to reduce their volume very quickly with extra pressure. And this can raise the pressure as much as 40 centimeters of water above atmospheric pressure. And this is just another unit of pressure. Instead of saying millimeters of mercury, we could say centimeters of water. They're pretty equivalent in terms of measurements. They're the distance of a fluid. So what's the big take home here? When we have relaxed breathing, we have a small increase in pressure that pushes the air out of our lungs. And when we have forced breathing, we have a dramatic increase in pressure that pushes air out of our lungs much faster. As we're looking at um, disorders, we can occasionally have air build up in the thoracic cavity from something like a stab or a puncture wound to the thoracic cavity. This is known as a pneumothorax when we have air in that pleural cavity. So there's something that punctures the thoracic wall and then instead of all the air getting sucked in through the trachea and the primary bronchi, air is sucked in through this big wound in the thoracic wall. And that as air is sucked in, the potential space of the pleural membrane becomes an air-filled cavity, and this air-filled cavity makes it difficult for us to regulate pressures for that lung and makes it much more likely for the lung to collapse. If the lung actually collapses, that is technically known as an atelicasis, atelectasis. And this is when the lung, a left or right lung, will partially or completely collapse. Oftentimes, uh, atelectasis will result from a pneumothorax, but it also can be from an airway obstruction or if the blood absorbs too many gases. Um, I personally have known of one person who had a collapsed lung atelectasis because of a pneumothorax. They fell out of their deer hunting tree stand in landed just right to crack a rib and puncture the thoracic cavity. Um, I also have another colleague who had, would have spontaneous atelectasis even though she was never having the pneumothorax. And that was because of a congenital birth defect to her lungs. Now as we look at things that can resist airflow. These are going to be the same kinds of things that resist fluid flow or blood flow within the circulatory system. So the diameter of the airway is very important. If we dilate the bronchi, we increase the diameter, and that's going to increase the rate of airflow. 
chemicals like epinephrine, which are associated with the sympathetic nervous system, are going to make our airways dilate so we can move air in and out quicker. If we have bronchoconstriction, and the root word here is to constrict to make smaller, what's being made smaller? The bronchioles are being made smaller. Decreasing the diameter of a bronchus or bronchiole is going to reduce airflow. And this can happen from parasympathetic stimulation, a neurotransmitter named histamine. Cold air is another common bronchodilator, or if we could have some chemical irritants. Uh, I'm thinking of myself personally. When I was in fourth grade, I had a pool chemical accident that resulted in me inhaling a bunch of chlorine gas. And when that chlorine gas got down into my lungs, it mixed with the water in my lungs and formed hydrochloric acid, which was a very major chemical irritant. And I had lots of bronchoconstriction that decreased the airflow to my lungs and resulted in me riding an ambulance to the emergency room and spending the night in the intensive care unit. Oh, I love pool chemicals. Now, as we look at pulmonary compliance, this is the idea that our lungs have a certain uh, amount of pliability or movability, um, malleability to them. So if the lungs can are very pliable or can move easily, it's easier for them to expand if we have that high pulmonary compliance versus low pulmonary compliance. Things that reduce pulmonary compliance are any kind of degenerative lung disease or something that could cause scar tissue to build up in the lungs. So for example, me inhaling chlorine glass reduced my lung compliance, my pulmonary compliance. I had scar tissue build up in my lungs from that. Other things include smoking, um, cancers, or maybe you had some major disease states like tuberculosis or COVID-19. Increase the amount of scar tissue in your lungs. Compliance ultimately is going to be limited by the surface tension of water. We can reduce surface tension by giving somebody a surfactant to lower overall surface tension and make it easier for them to expand the alveoli of their lungs. If somebody doesn't have enough surfactant in their lungs, they can have respiratory distress set in. Respiratory distress is a common condition among prematurely born infants who don't produce enough surfactant from their type 2 alveolar cells. And to help combat that respiratory distress, prematurely born infants or people who just don't have enough surfactant are oftentimes given a nebulizer to inhale surfactant into their lungs. Now, as we look at alveolar ventilation, the pulmonary compliance is important. Something else that we need to take into account is that we need the air to get into the alveoli themselves. We need the air to get into the respiratory zone of our lungs. If the air is only in the conducting zone, we don't have gas exchange. And that conducting zone makes up approximately 150 milliliters of volume. This conducting zone can be referred to as anatomic dead space because as far as our body is concerned, our anatomy is concerned, this is wasted space for gas exchange. We don't have gas exchange within this conducting zone. It's just a bunch of anatomic dead space. Our anatomic dead space can be altered with sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. So if we have sympathetic dilation, that's going to increase the anatomic dead space, but reduce resistance to flow, allowing for overall greater rates of flow. Some pulmonary diseases are going to cause the alveoli to be unable to exchange gases, and that will increase the anatomic dead space. Those alveoli become dead space in those situations. A good analogy for anatomic dead space would be breathing through a snorkel. When you breathe in and out of a snorkel, um, think of snorkels and fins in the pool. Um, that snorkel increases the amount of anatomic dead space by a couple hundred milliliters. The longer your snorkel, the harder you have to breathe in and out in order to get air into the respiratory zones where you have gas exchange in your alveoli. So there's, it's kind of a double-edged sword um, in that if you make your anatomic dead space larger by increasing the diameter of the tubes, you can have greater airflow, but that means you also need to move more air in order to get the air to the respiratory centers.